But could you talk about, you know, J.D. Vance is kind of laying out this picture. Ron is the big problem. But what he's really talking about, I feel like, is the axis of resistance that is, I think, the linchpin of what Israel and those U.S. politicians that back Israel so hard want to eliminate. Well, what what struck me in listening to him, and I hadn't heard that before, and I honestly haven't been paying that much attention to the uh, circus of American politics, uh, but what struck me is that he was talking in the standard imperial Washington lingo in which the United States gets to decide everything and gets to tell everyone what to do. But that's just not the case. What J.D. Vance and what... Uh, perhaps others in Washington don't understand, is that Iran is a sovereign country. Iran decides its fate. And that's why they hate Iran. That's why they're determined to find some way to destroy Iran. But again, you have to look at the sweep of history. Iran had a revolution in 1979 against an American-backed uh, puppet regime that acted as, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, uh, local native policemen in the region, brutal to, uh, the Shah was absolutely brutal to Iranians. And what the Iranian revolution did, and it was a, a true a, a revolution in the true sense, that it completely changed the system, it removed the old elites, it removed their old relationships, and it replaced them with a sovereign regime in Iran. Now, you can like that regime, you can love that regime, you can hate that regime because of its social policies or its uh, theology or whatever. People have that right, and Iranians disagree about that. But what there can be no argument about is that Iran is a sovereign country, and what it has been working to do is to build up its strength and its sovereignty to, in order to be able to defend that uh, sovereignty, which was gained not just through the revolution against the American-backed uh, Shah, but also the American-backed Iraqi invasion of Iran in um, 19, shortly after the revolution, and the war which was fueled against Iran. Iraq attacked Iran in, in 1979, uh, or 1980, and the war continued for eight years, but it continued because the United States, Western Europe, Germany, France, Britain, were supplying Iraq with weapons, the Gulf Arab states were funding the Iraqi war machine, and the goal was to destroy the, um, the Iranian revolution at birth. But Iran withstood that American-backed invasion, and again, paid a very high price. I haven't had the, the opportunity to go to Iran, but my Iranian friends tell me that, you know, in all, in every Iranian town, you see a memorial to all those people who died in that in the Iran-Iraq war, which again was an imperial proxy war. It's important to understand that. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because a country that has won its, its sovereignty and independence this way will not give it up easily. That's why Iran has defied all the constant predictions that, oh, the people are going to turn against the regime. What my understanding is that people may oppose the government on all sorts of things, but nobody wants Iran to be destroyed. Nobody wants Iran to be invaded. And so Iranians rally around. Now you spread that picture out across the region. And you see that Iran is in alliance with other like-minded movements and countries. So Hezbollah in Lebanon, the resistance movement, which was founded to resist the Israeli invasion uh, in 1982. Uh, in Syria, of course, uh, which is the, the literal land bridge between the resistance in Lebanon and Iran. And that's another reason why Syria was targeted by this proxy war for a decade that was designed, that was intended to topple its regime and replace it with a pro-American regime or a failed state like we see in Libya uh, and, and uh, in other countries invaded and destroyed by the United States. And then Ansarullah in Yemen, uh, similarly, you know, the United States, Britain, France, uh, and the Saudis uh, waged a war for nine years to try to destroy uh, the Ansarullah in Yemen, and they have only gained strength to the point where they're now independently uh, intervening uh, to enforce uh, 
a, a naval blockade, a maritime blockade on Israel uh, in solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. And the U.S. has thrown everything it can at this axis of resistance, and it's only gotten stronger. So I think the way to understand this axis of resistance is not in the terms that a J.D. Vance would use it. Oh, Iran, uh, you know, they're uh, troublemakers in the region and a Sunni Shia, uh, you know, split and all this bullshit. These are people who, like other people in the world, have decided, you know, we are going to determine the fate of our own country, not you. You don't get to tell us what to do. You don't get to steal our resources. You don't get to choose our leaders. We do. And if you like our leaders or hate them, it's not your, we don't care. It's not your problem. And this is the fundamental demand of people all over the region. It's the promise of the UN Charter that every nation is sovereign and independent and free from interference in its internal affairs from other countries. And so this axis of resistance is rolling back American imperialism in the region. It's rolling back European uh, imperialism and neocolonialism in the region. And it just doesn't matter if Americans love the government of Iran, I hate the government of Iran. That is purely the business of Iranians. And, and the same is true in the other countries. But what this has done, to bring it back to Gaza, is it has provided a strategic depth and width for the resistance in Palestine that is, is crucial. Gaza is completely blockaded and isolated. It's a tiny area. Why hasn't Israel been able to defeat and impose its will on the resistance in this really tiny area that has no natural resources? I've been to Gaza. It really has no natural resources. There's no oil. There's no diamonds. There's no gold. I don't know what else you might call a natural resource. There are no forests. Um, it, it, it's it's There are no mountains. There's no high ground. There's nowhere to hide. Of course, that's why the resistance went underground. But it's been able to fight, yes, because of the bravery and courage and heroism of the resistance and the skill of their planning and their long-term thinking. All of that is absolutely to their credit. But it's also because of the wider relationships and alliances with Iran, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And Hezbollah is waging a very sophisticated war against Israel in the north, entirely in support of Gaza. Hezbollah says, our battle with Israel right now is in support of Gaza. If there's a ceasefire that the resistance in Gaza accepts, we stop immediately. No point coming to talk to us about finding a separate solution uh, for, for the uh, fighting on the um, Lebanese front. We'll stop the minute uh, Israel uh, stops its genocide in Gaza. And Ansar Allah and Yemen have done the same. And Israel can't do a damn thing about it. They They are unable to, pre to, to prevent Hezbollah from destroying, and that's what Hezbollah has done. And we've covered this extensively on the Electronic Intifada uh, live stream. Our colleague John Elmer gives a brilliant military analysis of this almost every week. Systematic destruction of Israel's military and surveillance infrastructure on uh, the, the border with Lebanon. And Israel makes a lot of threats about, oh, we're going to deal a death blow to Lebanon and to Hezbollah, and we're going to turn it to Gaza. And, you know, never bet against Israel doing that, because, as we know, they're truly genocidal. But they haven't done it yet, when, when I think in previous years they would have by this point, because they're so weakened. They're so weakened. Uh, they don't have the ground forces to mount any kind of serious invasion of Lebanon. In 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon and was soundly defeated and humiliated. That was two decades ago. Hezbollah is far stronger now. And of course, the Israeli army, as we said, is already decimated by the resistance in Gaza. And at the same time, Israel's trump card has always been its, its air force and its air superiority and its ability to carpet bomb from the sky with virtually no opposition. And now they can't do that with Lebanon without the risk of massive mutually assured destruction. Yes, Israel can destroy Lebanon, but the Israelis now believe, and with good basis, that Lebanon can now destroy Israel.
Hmm. Yeah, I remember reading a report a year ago uh, before the Al Aqsa flood, and the report was that there were worries from the Israeli military establishment that if there was a broader war with Lebanon, that a thousand missiles would rain on Tel Aviv in about a two hour span. I mean, that's a very, very, that's a very large number of missiles. That is something the Iron Dome likely Hezbollah's wouldn't be able arsenal to defend. Them. Is far more sophisticated than that of Hamas or any other Palestinian group. Exactly. So these missiles, they would hurt, um, is the point. And I wanted to, uh, uh, on this point of uh, the resistance, also, if you could talk about the, you know, you mentioned the economic uh, strife that Israel is suffering. Talk about the role of, of Yemen right now, because, um, you know, uh, there are reports about the uh, Eilat ports being bankrupt now. And uh, the U.S. is engaging in strikes, it seems like, every other day trying to supposedly, as J.D. Vance said, right, these little strikes trying to stop uh, Ansarallah. Uh, but yet the blockade continues. So any comments on that? Yeah, and of course, remember, as I said, that, that uh, Barack Obama uh, began a genocidal war on Yemen in 2015. Um, and, uh, you know, with the Saudis and the British and the French, and they were at certain points bombing Yemen far more intensely, killing a lot of civilians, destroying uh, a lot in Yemen. But... Uh, achieving absolutely nothing in terms of diminishing the the determination of of Yemen to resist this and the development of their abilities it, it's the same story with Hamas with Hezbollah the more Israel and its uh uh allies for want of a better word have attacked the resistance assassinated its leaders uh, murdered civilians to try to demoralize the society or split the uh, or or, or uh, undermine the public support for the resistance the stronger they've gotten and that's the story in Yemen and in terms of the economic or the naval blockade on Israel it's very significant uh, if you look as i do i'm i'm not an expert on international shipping but i you know i watch channels that cover international shipping and i read read articles about this and Something like 80% of large container traffic is now being routed around the Cape of Good Hope. So having to go the long way around Africa to get from uh, Asia to Europe, from China to uh, and other Asian ports to Europe and vice versa. And this increases costs dramatically uh, because... Of course, it takes longer. It's more expensive in fuel for the ships. Insurance costs go up. There are huge logistical issues in terms of um, just the positioning of containers and ships and so on. It's all very complicated. But in terms of Israel itself, and, and by the way, these effects are only now starting to be felt because it takes a while for all of this to filter through the system. In terms of Israel, uh, several ships have been sunk which they weren't necessarily Israeli ships, but, you know, Ansar Allah identified what they said was some connection with Israel. And some have been sunk, you know, that we've seen footage of, I think, at least two, but possibly three large ships going down in the ocean. And the insurers look at that, the shippers look at that, and they say, that's not for us. And so, as you said, Elat, which is the main Red Sea port, an important port, as I understand, I think it's the main port for importing automobiles into Israel, is effectively shut down. Uh, but it's uh, what what it also means is that the the economic impact on Israel is also in terms of uh, in um, unavailability of certain basic goods. And more inflation as well. Costs go up there. And then don't forget you have Turkey, which has um, prohibited the export, uh, export of, of a wide range of goods, what they call dual-use goods to Israel. But this includes um, construction supplies and cement and concrete and steel and other things that are crucial to Israel's construction industry, which is a major part of the economy, real estate and and uh, you know building luxury condos and then trying to sell them to uh, rich American Zionists. Um, 
And uh, so that's come to a halt. Most of the labor, we don't often look, talk about the labor side. This is, this is underestimated. But uh, Israel, as much as it... Yeah, I'll, I, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but a few years ago, there was a lot of debate about uh, how much Israel resembles South Africa. And one of the arguments that was always made is that, oh, there's a difference between the apartheid regime in South Africa because the apartheid regime needed black workers. And that gave black workers, you know, a lot of strength. We saw you know, trade unions and the mining industry and so on in South Africa played a major role in the anti-apartheid struggle. But people would argue that Israel doesn't need the Palestinians the same way. And maybe that's true to uh, some extent, but it's less true than people think. Israel's entire construction sector and a large part of its agricultural sector depends on Palestinian labor and particularly Palestinians coming in from the occupied West Bank. But since October 7th, Israel has virtually banned those workers coming in. And uh, the result is that the construction industry, a major part of the economy, is pretty much shut down. So there are all these impacts that taken together erode Israel's long-term prospects and viability. and uh, you know, make it, I think, uh, an increasingly precarious uh, and a doomed colonial project. I don't want to sound, you know, overconfident about that, but that's the trajectory we see. And I don't, I, and, and this has been visible for decades, and Israel hasn't really been able to do anything to change that trajectory. It's, it's been on the same trajectory, and it's still on it. Mm. Yeah, and in, in many ways, I mean, I think just everything that you just outlined there summarized just, uh, it's all intensified. A lot of what we've been talking about, I mean, Ansar Allah maybe jumped into this um, uh, in solidarity with, uh, with the Palestinian people at this moment, but the entire axis of resistance has been at this for, for quite a long time, and Israel has been on this trajectory, as you said, for quite a long time. But it's this moment of Al-Aqsa flood, of the genocide. I, it's so much more pronounced and things just feel like they're accelerating so much faster than October 6, 2023 mm -hmm. and before that. Like, like it's just th This so much is world history. I mean, th this is this is the what we're seeing is the slow motion expulsion of the United States from a region that it has dominated and controlled since 1945, since it came in and effectively took the place of the, uh, the, the European colonial powers, primarily Britain and France. In 1945, the United States became the imperial power in the region. And it is being expelled from the region. Uh, and it's a slow motion expulsion. I'm sure J.D. Vance doesn't like it, and Joe Biden doesn't like it, and Donald Trump doesn't like it, even when, even though they sometimes profess uh, these sort of slightly maverick views. But uh, but th they all believe in U.S. hegemony and imperial power, and they want to preserve it. And they don't have, you know, this whole business about or is Iran is a troublemaker and uh, the the this I mean it was hilarious to the, to see J D Vance bring up the Abraham Accords, which was a Trump administration policy. This idea of normalizing relations between um, Arab tyrannies backed by the United States and Israel, and bringing them into an alliance against Iran. Uh, that was the the Trump policy. That was the Obama policy, and that's the Biden policy. Biden fully embraced the Abraham Accords. Biden embraced all of Trump's actions in the Middle East: the moving of the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, uh, recognition of Israel's illegal occupation of the Golan Heights, and so on. He didn't reverse any of that. He's continued it. But and remember, Jake Sullivan who is uh, Joe, Bi uh, Joe Biden's national security advisor, said, like, I think it was just weeks before October 7th, that the Middle East has never been calmer, everything is stable, everything's great. They thought they were going to get this Saudi-Israeli normalization deal, which was, you know, the cherry on the cake of the Abraham Accords. 
And then October 7 happened. And, you know, their their hubris, their ignorance, their lack of knowledge, their arrogance, all of it together means that they may or may not understand that the United States is being pushed out of the region. And I don't see that reversing because the United States has brought nothing but death and destruction to the people of the region. It extracts the resources. It, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's there to get the oil, get resources. I don't mean that in a simplistic way, but that's what it's about. It's about controlling world markets and the movement of, of energy and capital and so on. Uh, while the masses of the people in the region are impoverished under these American-backed dictatorships. And why would anyone choose that? Why would anyone choose that? When you think about a, a rising power like China, um, and what does China bring? It brings infrastructure. It brings development. Even in a U.S. client like Jordan, a U.S. vassal state like Jordan, I, you know, I, I go to Jordan uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, I noticed when I was uh, leaving Jordan the last time, the new airport, which opened a few years ago, it's this, you know, mo very modern airport. Uh, and it was run by, a, a, I think they gave the uh, franchise to run it to a French conglomerate. But when you walk onto the aircraft, the, the gates, the jetways that lead to the aircraft are Chinese. That basic infrastructure is Chinese. You have uh, roads, highways, hospitals being built around the world by China. Even again, a country like Jordan, a US vassal state, you see like Chinese cars everywhere. Like uh, this is just in the past two, three, four years. Um, and you just multiply that across the world. What do the Americans bring to the region? I don't see any American hospitals, even in a client state like Jordan, even, you know, a country where the regime has has given everything to the United States, all its loyalty. People aren't benefiting from that. Nobody's benefiting from that. Take Iraq, which was invaded and destroyed by the United States in, in the, the U.S. led aggression 20 years ago. China is rebuilding Iraq. China is rebuilding the infrastructure. Of course, Iraqis are, uh, are doing the work, but I'm I'm talking about in terms of the 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 infrastructure know-how and the contractors and so on. China is building thousands of schools in uh, in Iraq and across Africa. Of course, you have this these this propaganda in the West about oh how China is you know th this racist yellow peril propaganda about how it's all a secret scheme and China has its 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 desire, they are projecting onto China what the United States is actually doing whenever it claims it's coming to a country to, to help. The United States won't give you a penny or put a brick on top of another brick unless it's benefiting them. And they say it openly because when, when they talk about in Congress uh, funding, you know, sending another 60 billion for the proxy war against Russia in Ukraine, they say, oh, well, this is good for America because most of it goes to U.S. weapons companies. So they make no secret about that. Uh, so I, I'm saying this just to, to put in perspective why nobody loves the United States outside, uh, outside the United States. It's not loved except in a few islands like in, in Western Europe, a very irrelevant uh, and increasingly extremist and disturbing part of the world. And, you know, where else? Where else are they loved? <laughs>